Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God that his presence is here with us this morning. Uh, continue to remain in an attitude of praise and worship um, and allow God to work in your hearts to, to minister to you um, as you're hearing the word, as we're singing songs or praying. Allow the spirit of God to work uh, deep within us as we've been hearing uh, all these days through two weeks of our 21-day fasting. God has been speaking through different people about transformation um, and and hunger and thirsting for him. And so allow God to continue to do that work in you as we uh, are entering into the last few days of the year. Um, and uh, allow God to help you reflect back through the year on all his goodness, all his faithfulness, all the ways he has led us. Um, I can't believe we're already in December through the end of the year. Uh, this year has gone by uh, super quick and super slow all at the same time. So. So I thank God for all his faithfulness. Um, I am going to continue in, uh, uh, in our study of the series that we've been going through called The New and Living Way. Um, if you can put up the slides, we have come to the last section uh, of the overall series, which is called, can you go to the next slide? Oh, yeah. So we're in the last section, uh, which is New Heavens and New Earth. We're going to spend the next uh, few handful of weeks uh, going through this topic, and I'm just going to kick it off here today. Uh, as uh, If you've been keeping track, we've been going through this whole series, and this final section is really an encapsulation of kind of what we've been trying to say, what it all is leading up to. So, uh, you know, we started with how man was corrupted through sin, and God made a new covenant uh, to redeem man from his fallen state um, because he was headed to damnation without it. And through this new covenant, we have a new birth into the kingdom of God. He gave us a new heart uh, with which uh, we, uh, are, uh, uh, we have a new life within us which leads us to live for God rather than for ourselves. Uh, and through this new heart, a new birth, we produce new fruit, which is the fruit of the Spirit. We covered all of this. And also reminded us that we're now placed part of a new family, which is our own family, but also the family of God uh, uh, around the world who follow Christ out of a true, true heart. Um, and then last few weeks, we've been covering um, the topic of new purpose, which is our purpose uh, of, of serving God. Um, as in this new and living way for made for good works, uh, new purpose of living in holiness. Uh, we cover various things through that. And so we've now come to new heaven and new earth. And so, so if you can go to the next slide, I'll just kind of use that to set it up. So if you can see this uh, picture, just kind of summarizes really, uh, really the whole Bible. So we have Genesis 1 and 2, which is creation, the account of creation that God uh, created, everything that we see, uh, heaven and the earth, uh, from the first two chapters of Genesis, and he made man, and all of these things that he wanted, he made man uh, because he wanted fellowship with man. He existed before this time in eternity in a self-sufficient way, meaning he did not need man but he enjoyed fellowship or wanted fellowship with man. So just like, you know, when you get married, we don't need children, right, to exist, but we love having children because we love that relationship that we foster and grow, right? So it's not like a husband and wife needs children to survive, but the same example, God didn't need man or any creation for him to continue to exist uh, in a fully perfect way. But he made man to have fellowship with him. But uh, we all know the story that he put a choice of choosing to obey God or not obey God, and man chose disobedience, right? And therein fell the whole of creation into this giant, big chasm, 
which is from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation 20. Okay, that big giant chasm is the gap between perfect creation and the final conclusion of the purpose of creation, which um, God talks about through Isaiah in Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. And again in Isaiah 66, verse 22. For as the new heaven and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. If you study the Bible between, these, between this chasm period, the history of man uh, through the uh, biblical times, you can see this common thread a theme that God has spoken through the lives of men and women and through his prophets of his vision for a coming future, a vision for a coming eternity, a time which is described in a lot of detail, but not full. All, uh, all the details that we will only know once we're there is of this new Jerusalem, right? And if you read New Jerusalem, uh, uh, if you want to read about New Jerusalem, it is described in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, which is the, the kind of this bookends of, of, of the Bible, right? So in Revelation 21, 22, John is describing what he saw as a vision. He saw the new Jerusalem coming down as a bride adorned for God in all its glory coming down onto the earth, right? And he gave specific dimensions and talks about 12 foundations and 12 gates and made of pearls and all these different jewels and precious stones that made up the foundation uh, and all these things which really represents the church of God, the bride of Christ, or what God intended when he made man would be a beings who were made in his image, but choose to worship him, to obey him out of their own willingness. See, I often I get asked the question, if God didn't want us to sin, why did he put the tree in the garden? Why did he ask, why did he, make that tree and uh, make that fruit and tell Adam not to sin. Because following God is a choice. We're not robots. He wants us to willingly obey him. Choose holiness. He wants us to choose to follow him. And that is why Christ came and showed the example of perfect obedience. He could have sinned, but he chose to obey. What Adam couldn't do, Christ did in his life on earth. You all with me? So God is wanting such a people and he was willing to put up with this chasm. Put up with sin and corruption and, and wickedness through this time period. So because he saw, just like it says in Isaiah 66, the new Jerusalem that he will enjoy or have fellowship with the church in future. Right? So because of that, yeah, he said, I'm going to create a new heaven and new earth. People, some people defer or disagree that he's going to completely destroy the earth and remake it. It doesn't matter. The point is, God is going to do a new work. He's going to bring his church back with him. And his, just like in uh, Ezekiel 37, 27, it says, the tabernacle of God will dwell with man. So this was his vision for creation, for God to commune and dwell amongst men and have his fellowship with him in perfect relationship. Amongst the people who want to be with him, who chose to give their whole life for this promise of being his people, uh, to live in this. So in this new Jerusalem, there is no sin or evil or wickedness. Anything that you think of as evil will not be found in this place. Anybody who chose to live in that fashion will not be found in that place, right? So that is the point. That's why David, when he was uh, inaugurating or blessing the temple, he said, what can I make? Sorry, he was praying for the temple. He didn't bless the temple. His son Solomon did. Uh, but he said in Second Chronicles uh, 6.18, he said, you know, I can't make anything with my hands that will contain the eternal God. 
I cannot, no thing that man can make will contain, because everything we make is stained with sin and corruption. But God has seen a vision of New Jerusalem, of a perfect new heaven and new earth in, in eternity that he's bringing us forward to. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So what does this all mean for us? What does this all mean? So if you will, if you will allow me uh, to think about an example of a train. Okay, so I'm using this as a metaphor, uh, as a train, as a metaphor of all people, all ages through the course of history. Okay, it's the world, uh, if you will, this train kind of headed towards progressing through time. Okay, so you can think of the box cars as either specific periods of time, or or you can think of the each uh, box car as the social status you have. Maybe if you are born in a rich family, you are in the front end, you're a first class. Or if you are not so wealthy, you're uh, towards the middle or towards the back. Either way, you are part of this train that is heading forward in time that you have no control over where it's going because you're just a passenger. Okay? When man sinned, God gave the dominion of, of, uh, of the earth to, to the devil to rule, uh, you know, have dominion over the earth, right? So the devil is deciding where you sit, uh, you know, I mean, like with all the laws and the rules and things of what, how you're traveling in this train. But God is the one driving the train, okay? He's decided the course of history, and he's decided where world events are going. There is no changing, there's no derailing this train. There is no taking it off track because God has already decided where the course of history is going to go. He saw this chasm and he said, the world is headed on this train and all the people through history are on this train. And you can, you know, if the train was to continue in its path, it's headed into his judgment, into headed into destruction. But everybody who's born in this world are on this train. You all with me? So sometimes, you know, you're born in the last box car, you're like, you might be wondering, oh my gosh, why, do, why am I born in this family? Why am I born in this country? I'm in poverty, I don't have anything. I wish I was going to the front box car. It seems like life is so much better there. I might go to America, that's in the front. So life is going to be so much better. But people in the box car don't realize where the train is heading. Right? We're, our goal and our vision is for to reach New Jerusalem, a place we can't even imagine of unimaginable fellowship with Christ. So sometimes we are so short-sighted, we only think about where our seat is, just like in church, right? We, like we want our seat, and that's all. We, we don't want to uh, move or adjust. So we only think about our seat, assigned seat in the boxcar, our career or, or our family, buying a house, all these things, right? Represent your life in this boxcar or in the train that you have no control over and that you're just a passenger on. That's why in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about the men and women of faith uh, they knew, Hebrews chapter 11, verse, um, I want to get there real quick. Uh, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed them, that were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So, they knew the people who chose God, whether it's in the Old Testament, saints, they knew that this is not where they're meant to be. That there is a God who's prepared a future. And they might not have received the promise. Right? They might have been in the front box car or the back box car. It doesn't matter. They knew that this was not it. That there was a time where God will redeem them. And many of them died without receiving the promise, right? Which was the promise of the Messiah because they knew they needed somebody 
to save them from the situation. Yes? This is, I mean, that, this is, if I were to summarize everything that we've been speaking about, this is, this is the point. Is all of the new covenant, the new birth, new heart, the new purpose, all of these are so that God can redeem us from this train headed for destruction. You all with me? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Okay. All right. So, so this is the point of the whole series. God had made a new way, a new and living way for us to escape the sure destruction if you stayed on this car. Sure, you know, we, you know, if we live, you might live out our life on this car, right? That's the point, is that our whole life you might never see. Think of all your, you know, loved ones who left the earth before us. They, you know, this is all they knew in, in their, with their physical eyes, this, this train. That's all they knew. You know, their whole lives were spent living in this car. But their inner eyes saw the new Jerusalem that was to come. Their faith was uh, stored up in heaven that that's what drove their life. That it was not the moment, momentary pleasures of as Moses. I mean, there's so many examples in the Bible of people who chose eternity over Christ, whether in the New Testament or Old Testament. It talks about Moses. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a moment. He thought that the reproach of Christ was far better than the pleasures of sin for a moment. This is the purpose. We might have a, you know, we might somehow through our effort get to the front boss car and have a wonderful career, a wonderful life here and on this earth. It doesn't change the course of history. You all with me? So this, this is the point of this topic. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, it's a little coming back to this. Okay, so that was just illustrating this point, the train is headed down this chasm. It's into the unending, bottomless chasm. The only way to get out is through the redemption of the church, which Christ made a way for that. Because he came down in the midst of our suffering and died for us so that he can pull us out of this train. He can redeem the church. You know, we might not see it physically if we die before he comes. But the point is, he's going to say, pull us out and move us into New Jerusalem. Amen. Amen? This is our hope. This is a glorious hope that we have. That we will be part of this future with Christ. That no matter how good the, this, this first class ticket you got on earth, maybe you, know, you didn't choose what family you were born in. You didn't choose uh, what, uh, what happened to your life uh, and what, what course of history you were born in. You were in the 16th century or the 21st century. That You did not get to choose those. But you have a choice where you will spend eternity. Amen? You have a choice how you live your life now so that you may be with Christ when he comes back to redeem the church. Amen. And you can see that if, you know, the, you know may, maybe we'll cover some of these topics as we finish this talk, the series. You know, what we're seeing in the world course of history, you know, some of us, we like to study is eschatology and speak of all the, you know, analyze all the things that are happening and try to connect the dots. You know, I'm not smart enough to know What's happening when and when God is going to do, you know, you know, March 2025, this particular, I'm, you know, I'm not smart enough to know that. God didn't give anybody the vision to know exactly what things are happening. But I know, just like Jesus warned the Israelites, when the fig tree is blossoming, you know, what? The summer is near, right? So when God has given us the wisdom to discern between the signs and times. So what is happening is you, as, as you see, uh, you can see about the, uh, 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 the future described in the Bible coming to pass in our own lifetimes, right? It's like this mu uh, musical piece that an orchestra, orchestra performs, and the final portion is this crescendo, right? This, you know, it's a buildup, and this final, grand finale builds up to this you know, final crescendo. That's what is happening. That's what's really when you say the Antichrist, that's what is encapsulating is the fullness of evil in one man, right? That is, I don't know who it is. To me, I hope I'm not here to find out, okay? 
I don't care who it is because I'm not planning to be here. So my point is you can choose whether you want, you know, where you want to be. Right? God is prepared a new Jerusalem in his mercy. He didn't have to do any of this. He could have destroyed all of creation and started over again in Genesis 3. It would have been a very short book. Right? But he loved us. Why did he again ask the question? Why did God make man if he knew he was going to sin? Because he saw you. He saw each one of you. He said, I'm going to be with this person. I want to be with you. So it's worth it. It's worth it for me to put up with sin and corrupt. Because I'm going to get to be with you in eternity. That's why he made us. Amen. He loved us so much. And he chose to die for us. The moment he, before Adam sinned, he made a plan. That he would die for us. Amen. If you, you can look at the worship team, uh, please come up. Um, I mean, you can look at the example of Lot. It's such an allegory for all of this. You know, Lot chose, he wanted to be in first class. You know, so he chose with his eyes. He said, you know what, I better be, you know, Abraham said, you can choose whichever one. I'll be, God will, you know, he knew I'm a pilgrim. God will take care of me no matter what. Lot cared a lot about which car he was going to be in. He wanted to be in first class. He didn't know that that first class was full of sin and wickedness, right? And he lived there, and his, you know, his, uh, uh, his family did not know the tradition of faith that they had, right? And so he was, had a hard time. The angels were saying, I cannot... You know, uh, I cannot destroy the city until you leave this place. Just like, that's why I believe that God's judgment will only come after the church is raptured. Because he said the same thing to Lot. I can't destroy it because Abraham, who represents Christ in the story, interceded. He said, God, if there's ten people, don't destroy the city. But there weren't even ten people. So God made a way for Angels who are like Christ who came and took the church out. He said, I will destroy after you're gone. But Lot chose. He was vexed by the wickedness. Just like we're vexed by all the laws and things and wickedness that's happening around us. But he didn't really want to leave. He was trying to fight it. He barely escaped destruction. That is not our goal in this world. Is to barely escape. Let us live in the fullness of of this glorious hope. That this is what we're living for. New Jerusalem. This is why we're here. I don't care if I'm rich or poor. Or what period of time I'm born in. No, no matter what's happening to me. I'm going to live out this life. With the purpose that God has given me. And I'm going to choose. To not just barely escape. I'm going to live like Abraham. If you go to the uh, next slide. Um, there's two story, Two examples you can see. Oh. Uh, one is Abraham. He said, I'm a, uh, he looked for us. He was actually rich in this world. But he, nothing about Abraham's riches is mentioned in the New Testament. But the New Testament talks about his faith. He said, he looked for a city whose foundation, whose builder and maker is God. That is the new Jerusalem he's talking about. So he lived in tents. Said, I, I don't care about what I'm going through right now. I'm waiting for that city. Amen. That is my glorious hope. Amen. Amen? Look at, uh, look at Job. He, he suffered more than any man in history. And so when we suffer, we can look up to him because he said, For I know my Redeemer lives. Amen. And in the end, he shall stand in the earth. This is before Christ came. He had that hope in him even before Christ came. He had that hope, my Redeemer. He, so he said, even though my body will be eaten up by worms, he will, I will stand with him in eternity. And this is our glorious hope as well. So let us not barely escape, but let's live this life with intentionality and purpose in this new and living way. May His name be glorified.